Hi, everyone, and welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuary's live interaction. We will begin this program, Killer Whale Tales, promptly at 2 p.m., so stay tuned. All right, welcome everyone to a National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants live interaction. Today we have many guests. We have Jeff Hogan from Killer Whale Tales and Jacqueline Lavender from Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. But I'd like to introduce our host, Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants to give us a run of show about how today's interaction will go. Hey, Joe. All right, hey, Hannah, great to see you today. I'm gonna share my screen here. Should come up now. All right. Well, my name is Joe Gorowski. I run a, an organization called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And so we bring science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond through virtual field trips and virtual guest speakers. So it's always a lot of fun uh, doing our events with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. If you visit our website, exploringbytheseat.com, you can find all sorts of great things. Uh, the spot to sign up for the newsletter to find out when events are coming up. And then during the school year, we often host 30 to 50 live events for classrooms a month. Uh, during the summer, things are a little quieter, but a little peek at some events coming up, along with some events with the National uh, Marine Sanctuaries. We have Jill Heinrich doing some cave diving next week, and then some lemur science action with the Duke uh, Lemur Center coming up. So you can check all that out there. Now for today's event, we're gonna use a fun program called Slido. So for everybody who's tuning in from home, it's gonna be very interactive today. There's gonna to be some poll questions, some quiz questions, and you can take part in those live with us. So a uh, couple ways to get there. We've got the Slido website. It's just sli.do, and that'll bring you to the website and it'll ask for an event code. Use ORCA. There's also the direct link, which I have up here, and I will have posted in the chat bar. And then if you're fast and wanna do it on your cell phone, we have a QR code up here that you can use uh, to scan quickly and get yourself into the room before we start our live interaction part. So we'll leave that up for another second or two. All right, I'm gonna come back from my screen share now. So uh, as mentioned, we're really excited for today's live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. It's entitled Killer Whale Tales in the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And we're pretty lucky today to have Jeff Hogan, the founder of Killer Whale Tales, joining us, as well as Jacqueline Labrador, Education and Outreach Coordinator at Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. But before we hear a little bit from them, I'm going to send things back to Hannah to give us a little overview of the National Marine Sanctuaries. Thank you, Joe. I'm super excited to introduce you all to the National Marine Sanctuary System or revisit it if you've been attending our live interactions before. So the NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries is a network of 14 marine protected areas 
in two marine national monuments, encompassing over 600,000 square miles of marine waters. We span everywhere from Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, where we'll learn about more in detail today, down to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and we even have a fresh water site in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary that protects shipwrecks. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a virtual tour of these with you. But before that, I want to show you that this live interaction is very, very engaging. So let's head on over to Slido and answer the question, are you watching this live stream with others? And if so, how many? And as Joe mentioned, the Slido link is in the chat room and the event code is ORCA. All right, well, Hannah, I can see a lot of people are already starting to find uh, the chat and start to fill out the survey, which is really cool. And so we'll take a quick look at some of the results for that first question. Um, okay, lots of groups. One, two, five, 40. That's a big group. Uh, so yeah, lots of alone and then all the way stretching to 40. Awesome. That's great to hear. That's a big room of people. So we will move forward with another Slido question. Have you heard of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries before? This is always a fun one to get a read on. All right. Wow, 86% have heard of the marine sanctuaries. That's awesome. So we are going to now kick off our virtual tour, and we're going to start in the most northwest corner of the sanctuary system in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. It's actually the most northwest corner of continental U.S., and here we protect deep sea ecosystems as well as very, very biodiverse uh, tidal ecosystems like you can see here. Going further south, we have Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary where you can see this elephant seal on the beach. Even south from there, still in Northern California, we have Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary which is known for its deep sea corals. And Connected to Cordell Bank, we also have Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, known for some of the greatest deep sea research finds, like this brooding octopus garden. Further south in California, off the coast of Channel or off the coast of Santa Barbara, we have Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which protects abundant kelp forests. Further out into the Pacific, we have Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is one of the largest marine conservation areas in the world. We have Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the breeding grounds for humpback whales. We have the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, which protects Big Mama, the largest known coral head in the world. We have Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, 100 nautical miles off the coast of Texas that protects great reef ecosystems. Further south, we have Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary protecting the Florida Keys reef track. Going north, we have Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary in the Atlantic off the coast of Georgia. And our very first National Marine Sanctuary, Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, protects the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck. Our newest National Marine Sanctuary is Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary, just established in November of 2019. And it protects World War I and World War II era shipwrecks, as you can see here in this photo. Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is located in Massachusetts Bay and is one of the best places to go whale watching. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary it protects over 200 shipwrecks in Lake Huron off of the coast of Alpena, Michigan. All right, now that we've done our virtual tour, we're going to head back over to Slido. And I'm really interested, now that we did the tour, has anyone ever visited a National Marine Sanctuary before? All right, well, great to see a big group joining us uh, in the Slido today. That's lots of fun, so there'll be some good interaction coming up. And if we look at our results so far, uh, almost split again. We've got 54% who, yep, absolutely have, and 46 who haven't. That's great. All right. Well, with that, I 
want to go a little bit deeper into what the National Marine Sanctuaries actually do and what they are. So National Marine Sanctuaries protect things like the sea giants, the humpback whales in Monterey Bay and Stellwagen Bank to the small sea life, like the reef fish and corals that are amongst many of our different ecosystems. These places protect abundant biodiversity and provide places of shelter for some of the most charismatic marine species like this green sea turtle and the endangered Hawaiian monk seal. These places also protect maritime heritage like shipwrecks in Thunder Bay and in Mallows Bay, Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary. These places are there to provide resource protection for generations to come. These are very special places. Here we have a photo of the coast in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. These are your places to paddle, to fish, to snorkel, to boat, and to surf. Again, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary's beautiful coast. And th with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Jacqueline Lavender, great photo to end on because she is going to talk to us more about Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. Okay, thanks Hannah. Let's see if you guys can see my screen here. Can you see that? Okay, great. Well, okay, hello and welcome everyone. And again, thank you, Hannah. That was an awesome tour of the National Marine Sanctuary System. Um, my name again is Jacqueline Lavender, and I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And I'm going to bring you back to where Hannah started and actually entered her tour to Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, which is located off the coast of Washington State. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our magnificent coastal waters, um, I want to give you a brief overview before we dive into Jeff Hogan and his killer whale tales. So take a look at this map shown here, and you can see that Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary protects that area that's outlined in red. So this large area covers nearly 3,200 square miles of marine waters off of Washington's coast. And the sanctuary extends 40 miles offshore in the northern edge. And then you can see how it follows the continental shelf and ends up in the southern area, reaching approximately 20 miles offshore. And the sanctuary borders protected areas, including Olympic National Park, the Washington Maritime National Wildlife Refuge Complex, Washington State Parks, as well as the traditional lands past and present of the Macaw, Puyu, and Ho tribes and the Quinault Indian Nation. The sanctuary itself lies within the usual and accustomed fishing and hunting areas of these coastal air, um, treaty tribes and have supported humans for thousands of years. And Olympic Coast has many different habitats, including rocky and sandy um, intertidal areas. There's near shore of kelp forests, there's subtidal reefs, open ocean, submarine canyons, and even deep sea coral and sponge communities. So this makes it the perfect place for a wide variety of marine life to coexist. It actually happens to be one of the most diverse and productive marine ecosystems in the entire world. There's 29 different species of marine mammals. There's 128 species of seabirds, and it's teeming with numerous fish and invertebrate species. So at this point, Joe, I was gonna take a moment and ask you to, it's time to ask my question. What is your favorite marine animal? All right, so those who might have left the slider room, head back in. I opened the, the question. We're gonna collect a little word cloud and see what's coming in so far. So it's already starting to come in. Lots of killer whale or orca. We've got sea lions, sea turtles. Ooh, yes, nudibranchs, love the nudies. Uh, gray whales, urchins, otters, harbor seals. Let's see if we can get the trend here. Lots and lots of dolphin, lots and lots of orca. So that's good. They came to the right spot today. Well, that's awesome, you guys. <laughs> So many great answers, and I think that you're going to see that a lot of your favorite animals actually live in Olympic Coast. So I'm going to show you a quick video where you can get a sneak peek into the wild and exceptional area of Olympic Coast, where you're going to see some, again, some of these incredible animals that you enjoy so much in the protective waters of the sanctuary. 
So give me a moment as I share that with you. Okay, I'm looking for the video here and I don't see it. So I'm gonna just play it off of my computer and hopefully you guys can see it there. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, so now this is the time you've been waiting for. Join me as we welcome Jeff Hogan, the founder and executive director of Killer Whale Tales. We are very excited to have him here. So join us. Welcome, Jeff. Great. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Jacqueline and I are both sitting in Washington State. We're a little bit distant, though. I'm actually uh, in Seattle. She's more out on the Olympic Peninsula. But uh, we're coming to you from the warm Pacific Northwest. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you in a moment. Uh, to uh, do our activity today, you're going to need a pencil and a piece of paper. So go ahead and grab a piece of scrap paper. A pen works fine. If you want to use a crayon, I don't really care. It's completely up to you. So while I transition over to my screen, Go ahead and um, grab yourself something to write with and a piece of paper, and we will get started. So uh, before we get started and the program, go ahead and grab that pencil, like I said. But I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. I am indeed the founder and director of Killer Whale Tells. We are a nonprofit here in Washington State, and we spend a good chunk of the school year visiting kids all up and down the west coast of the United States, getting them involved in killer whale conservation. So we'll talk more about that program in a little bit. I've got other games you can play online, and you can join us uh, at some other time at another event as well. So before we get started, let's go ahead and talk about my favorite subject, and you can probably guess what my favorite subject is. It, of course, is me. That's right. Okay, I'm joking. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So not only am I the founder of Killer Whale Tales, but I also spend a lot of time hanging out with southern resident killer whales. I started studying these animals about 20 years ago. In this picture you see here, I'm actually uh, putting a suction cup tag on the side of these animals. This project that we're working on is continuing this summer, and the tag that I'm applying records not only how deep they dive, it records how fast they swim, it records what direction they go underwater, and the coolest thing, it's recording everything they say and hear. So imagine shrinking yourself down to about the size of your thumb, putting yourself on the back of a killer whale and going everywhere that whale goes, and we're using that information to inform us not only about what their behavior is, what they're doing underwater, but we're also using this information to help protect them. I've also spent a lot of my time uh, trying to determine whether or not boats are impacting whale behavior, and Hannah and I will talk about that in a little bit. And I've also spent a lot of my life scooping whale poop. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how can I get a job as awesome as scooping whale poop? Well, it's a pretty amazing project, and you're probably also wondering, hey, wait a minute, how do I get this job? I'm joking, you may not want it, uh, but why? Why are you scooping poop? Well, if you scoop the whale's poop, you can figure out what they've been eating. Not only can you tell what they've been eating, but it's a great way to monitor their health. Poop can tell you if they're sick. Poop can tell you if the whales are stressed out. Poop can tell you if they're starving. Poop can even tell you if a female whale is pregnant, was pregnant, will never be pregnant again, and you can even use poop to tell which animals are related to which other animals. So if you remember nothing else from today, please remember that poop is very scientifically important. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the whales we're going to be using in the game today. I mentioned their name a moment ago. We're going to be talking about southern 
resident killer whales. But as you probably know, orcas are found all around the planet. So no matter where you go on the planet, you're gonna find three things. Of course, you're gonna find killer whales and that's their habitat range. If you go around the planet, you're also gonna find humans. And of course, if you go around the planet, you're gonna find the habitat of Starbucks. Okay, we're not gonna talk about all the different types of killer whales today, all right? Here's all the different types. So if you look closely at this uh, beautiful um, poster that my friend Uko made, you can tell that, hey, you know what? Most orcas look pretty similar. But if you look really close, you'll be like, wait a minute, there are differences. So please notice that orcas around the world are not only different sizes, they're different shapes. Some of the colorations are quite different. We're not gonna talk about every type of killer whale today. As I said a moment ago, we're just gonna focus on the group right there. Those are Southern resident killer whales. They're seen up and down the West Coast of the United States. They're seen in the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, particularly in the winter. And this is the group we're gonna focus on today. So we have been studying these animals for quite some time, since the early 70s, and we know a lot about them. So Southern resident killer whales, as I said, have a huge habitat range. You can see them all the way down in Monterey, California. You can see them all the way north up to Southeast Alaska. These animals tend to hang out in the Washington state area, particularly in the early summer through the early winter before they spread out up and down the coast. They travel in large groups. Of course, that's called a pod. Uh, they're exclusively fish eaters. Southern resident killer whales only eat fish. I know you've seen videos of killer whales eating seals and dolphins and porpoises and stingrays. Yes, other types of killer whales do eat those things. Southern residents are only eating fish. They seem to really prefer salmon. Their favorite salmon is Chinook. And we're gonna talk a lot about that today when we play the game. These animals spend about half their life looking for food. Yes, day and night. They have their own language. No other killer whales on the planet share the same calls that Southern residents make. Sadly though, these animals are endangered. In fact, as of uh, this morning, we're down to about 72 total animals in this unique population. So if you're a school age student and you're in a class of about 30 kids, if you brought in another classroom of kids, that's about 60 kids. In other words, there's gonna be about as many students in two classrooms as there are this type of orca left on the planet. Later on today, I'll give you some things you can do at your home to help protect them. But let's go ahead and play the game. So what I'm gonna do is, is we're gonna uh, take the data that we've used in our prey sampling study here in the Pacific Northwest, and we're gonna use scientific method. Hopefully you've heard of this before. If you haven't, we're gonna do a very quick review of it. We're gonna use this method to play the game. Anytime a scientist wants to know something about the world, and something they're gonna study, they're gonna ask a question. They'll do a little background research. Then they're gonna try to answer that question before they do the project, okay? They're gonna collect some information uh, by doing the uh, study. They're gonna test whether their prediction was correct. After they analyze their data, come up with their uh, conclusion, they're gonna then communicate those results to the general public. So today, we're gonna ask five questions, okay? And I think Joe is gonna help me out here. We've got five different questions that we wanna answer today. They all deal with Southern resident killer whales. And what we're gonna do is I'll ask the question and then using Slido, you guys can fill in what you think the answers are. In other words, you're gonna make a hypothesis. You're gonna make a prediction, okay? So there are five questions. Let's do the first one first. So, what are southern resident killer whales eating? So go ahead and uh, hop over onto Slido, go ahead and enter that. What are they eating? I told you they're probably eating salmon, but maybe they are eating other types of fish. If so, what other types, okay? I'm also gonna ask you to answer this question. When are they eating it? Do these animals eat every day? Do they eat once a week? Are they like humpback whales where they only eat during one part of the year but don't eat at other parts? I also want you to tell me where are they eating it? I know you're gonna say, Jeff, they're eating it in the ocean, but where specifically? Are they in deep water? Are they in shallow water? Are they in both? Do they eat near the land? Do they have their own uh, foraging area that they go to, like a restaurant? I also want to know who is eating it. 
In our area, we have three groups of killer whales that make up that southern resident community, J-Pod, K-Pod, and L-Pod. They are three unique groups within the community. Which group is eating the most? You can answer J's, K's, or L's. And finally, where is the food coming from? All right, I'll give you a few moments to go ahead and answer those questions. Joe, if you can pop in and let me know what some of the answers are, I will keep track of them as well. Then we'll continue the game and collect some data and find out whose predictions or hypotheses were correct. All right, absolutely. So just a reminder, the Slido room is open. All those questions are there to be answered right now in the latest poll. I can see, yeah, people are just starting to head in and start putting some of those answers in. So let's get over to the Slido room. Let's take a minute or two. Uh, to get some answers in, and then Jeff, I'll start sending some your way shortly. Sounds good. All right, let's take a little look and see what's coming in. All right, what are they eating? We've got lots of answers, obviously a lot of salmon. Somebody here says goldfish. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, big fish, uh, yeah, big fish. Someone's thinking maybe some cod, but definitely lots of salmon coming in. Great. Uh, let's keep moving. When are they eating? We've got lots of answers here. Uh, every day, we've got some saying, you know, as you mentioned earlier, 50 to 60% of the time, some think maybe it's late summer, early fall, uh, and then a few others think, well, they're a killer whale whenever they want. <laughs> All right, where are they eating at? Let's see, a lot of shallow waters, shallow waters near land. Uh, a couple went with um, uh, deeper, and then we've got someone else who says uh, in the ocean and where the fish live. So yes, that's probably true. <laughs> yeah, good guess. All right, who's eating it? We've got K-Pod, that came in the most. Did you say, Joe, did you say K as in kicking, K? Yeah, yeah. Okay. K-Pod came up the most there. Where is it coming from? We've got a nice mix between rivers. Um, offshore, fish passing by. And lastly, if we go to our predictions, um, not a lot of kind of predictions. Don't be shy with your predictions, uh, people who are tuning in, but we do have a couple here. Someone predicts that they're probably eating right now. Uh, <laughs> and then some think that they eat a lot uh, before they migrate. Cool. Awesome. Those are all great predictions. And so, Joe, let's keep those on our uh, plate as we go forward, because we're going to come back and we're going to see which one of those were correct and maybe the ones that aren't correct. And don't forget, we're scientists. And it's actually, I'm going to pause you, sorry, Jeff, for just a moment, because yeah, uh, another big whack of predictions came in, so we should bring a couple more in. Okay. Uh, some think there's not enough salmon, and that's why they might not be doing well. Um, actually, that came in a few times. Some believe pollution uh, is playing a role as well. So a lot of people think they're having a hard time, and many due to uh, pollution and um, less of the fish Lack that they like food. to Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, let's remember all of our predictions, because like I said, in a few moments, we're going to collect some data and see which ones are correct. And don't forget, as I was about to say, scientists don't mind being wrong. It's always, excuse me, <clears throat> it's always okay to be wrong, all right? Scientists love to be wrong. So if you make a prediction that's not correct, it's just as good as one that is correct, okay? It's not a test. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and play the game. And the problem is, how are we going to test these predictions, right? How are we going to collect information about these guys and what they're eating? Well, currently happening right now in our area, we are doing what is called a prey sample collection. And basically what we do is we go out on our research boat and we wait for the whales to hunt down and kill a fish. Okay, so the fish will be obviously under the surface. The whales will come together usually as a pod. They will kill that fish. They'll tear it apart. Oftentimes they share it. These killer whales need anywhere between 50 and 400 pounds of fish per whale per day. So when they're done eating, they're pretty sloppy eaters and they will often leave chunks behind. So if you see the image on the left side of the screen, 
that's a pretty good chunk of fish right there. I rarely see that big of a chunk left over. What I normally see is what's in those tweezers over there. Those little, in those tweezers, those are fish scales. So they're about the size of your uh, pinky fingernail. Those fish scales will float in the water column. We'll take a pool net like you can see there. We'll scoop those uh, prey samples out. We'll take them back to the lab. We'll analyze them. Not only can we figure out what type of salmon the whale ate by analyzing the scales, but sometimes we can use the information, the DNA in that scale to track that fish back to the stream and river it was born in. So think about that. Not only can I tell what these whales are eating, but I can tell where it came from. And if I know where it came from, as some of you mentioned, uh, lack of food's a problem and we need to start protecting these rivers and these salmon streams. What better information is there to have than the exact stream or river that's producing fish so that we can protect it? So it's obviously a very important project and let's get started. So I would love right now, nothing more than to send you all a big stinky bag of salmon scales that the whales had eaten. Sadly, I can't do that. So instead what I've done is I've made a bunch of scales using these poker chips. So take a look at this poker chip. This will be our fish scale. You will see on the scale here that I've recorded a bunch of information. So you will notice that this fish was killed in July. That's the first line. The second line is SJI. Those are the San Juan Islands. Those are gonna be a little bit east of the uh, Olympic National Marine Sanctuary. And that's where these whales are frequently seen in the summer, the San Juan Islands. Line three tells you J-Pod. This is the pod that killed and ate this fish. Line four tells you it was a Chinook. And the last line says MFR. That's an abbreviation for the Middle Fraser River. That is a huge river system north of us in British Columbia. That's where that fish was going back to when it was eaten. So hopefully you can read these scales and it's pretty simple. So what we're gonna do now is go ahead and grab your piece of paper and just quickly, if you can, make a quick data sheet that looks somewhat like mine. The most important thing you need to have on your data sheet is you need to have the month. And if you don't wanna write out all the months right now, you can do it during the game, that's fine. You need to have an area for the pod. Make sure you have J's, K's, L's, and an unknown pod. Areas are gonna be GS for Georgia Strait, San Juan Islands for SJI, PS is Puget Sound, which is a large inland ocean here in Washington State. And then we, of course, have Rosario Strait. Fish type goes from Chinook to the Chum, Steelhead, all the way through Flatfish and Unknown. And rivers can be Sacramento, South Puget Sound rivers, Columbia, the Thompson River system here, the Fraser River system here, and of course, Unknown. So just jot down a quick piece of paper a month area, a pod area, an area area, a fish area, and a rivers, because in a moment, I'm gonna have you analyze a bunch of scales, you're gonna record the data, and at the end, we'll analyze the data and we'll see whose predictions are correct. So, I'm gonna give you about a minute to quickly put together a data sheet that looks like this. Again, you don't have to write down all the months or all the fish types, you can do that as we play the game, okay? So I'll give you about one minute to put this data sheet together on a scrap piece of paper. And once you do, I will start giving you fish scales to record and analyze. Don't worry, like I said, you can actually do a lot of this during the game. Just get those five major columns on the paper. Okay, Joe, what do you think? Do you think most people got it? I think so. We seem to have a pretty quick audience today. Okay, all right, so grab your data sheet and let's start recording these scales. So the scale I just showed you a moment ago was July San Juan, J-Pod, Chinook, Middle Fraser River. So go ahead on your data sheet, go ahead and put a little line by July like I've done on my data sheet. Go ahead and put a little check by J-Pod. Go ahead and make a check by the San Juan Islands. Go ahead and make a little uh, check for the Chinook fish. 
And then last but not least, find MFR or write MFR under your river column and put a check next to that. So if you've done it correctly, obviously we've got one July, one JPOD, one San Juan sample, one Chinook sample, and one sample from the middle Fraser River. Hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory to you. Of course, this is not enough data to really test our predictions because it's one fish. And don't forget, these animals are eating at least four, five, six, maybe 10 fish a day over the course of the entire year. So let's get some more data before we analyze our um, predictions. So I'm going to show you three more scales right here. Notice there's a red one, a blue one, and of course the one on the right. Go ahead and record the data. And yes, I'm gonna, I know you're going to go, wait a minute, Jeff. July San Juan J-Pod Chinook, we just had that. Yes, you did, but don't forget, this is a different fish than you one had a minute ago. So go ahead and record these three scales. Once you're done, your data sheet should look pretty similar to mine. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to transfer the data from those three scales over to your data sheet. Go ahead. All right, Joe said we have a pretty quick group, so I'm going to hope that you did get that data down. If you didn't, go ahead and take a couple extra seconds to finish it, because in a moment, I'm going to show you lots and lots of scales, and you're going to go at your own pace, okay? So I'm going to pull up the screen now. We're going to show you lots and lots of data here. There's the three things as I put it together. Here are your scales. I'm going to show you three pages of these at your own pace. Please record one scale at a time. If I'm you, I start in the top left-hand corner, June, Rosario Strait, J. Pod, Chinook, North Thompson, and then go to the next one. Go one scale at a time. Go as quickly as you can, but accuracy is more important. If you don't have accurate data, we can't test our predictions. So go as slow as you would like, as accurately as you can, and record the data. Start to see as you're recording data if you start to see patterns. Hopefully you'll start to see patterns showing up that will either prove what your predictions were are correct or will be like, wait a minute, my predictions weren't correct at all. So go ahead, I'm gonna give you about three or four minutes to do as many of these as you can and then we'll go on to the second part of the recording game. Go ahead and give it a shot and I'm gonna play along with you. Three minutes for this round, please. So Jeff, as I watch you kind of scan and take some of these down, um, this to you must just be like second nature, having right. done this for so long. Yeah, and I think actually the people that are participating, once you get the system down, it tends to go pretty quickly. Um, just getting it, the first couple down is always seems to be the problem. But if anyone's jammed up, shoot us, um, a question or a comment and I will help you out as we go. Okay, got about one minute left of this round. And I know some of you are thinking, hey, wait a minute, uh, is, this, um, is this actual data or are you making this up? This is actual data. We've actually scooped all of these scales. And hopefully you're starting to see some uh, 
patterns developing. Okay, we're down to our last few seconds of this round. So go ahead and whatever scale you're working on right now, go ahead and make that your last one. If you've only done three, fantastic, that's fine. If you've done all of them, great. Half is great too. But go ahead and finish up this last scale and then we're gonna go on to the next page of scales and you'll get to do it again. And hopefully, as Joe just pointed out, it'll start to get quicker as you get more experience doing it. Okay. So now we're going to go on to the second uh, page of scales. It's the same game. Continue on collecting data. Give you about three minutes to do this page as well. Again, accuracy is more important than speed. So do as many as you can, but make sure you're doing them accurately as you can. And I have noticed that some people are noticing, uh, popping up in the Q&A, most people are seeing, wow, June seems to be a pretty big month for these whales. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So good observation. Okay, about two minutes left of this round. About one minute left. All right, so go ahead and finish up your last scale, and we're gonna go to the final round of data collection, and I'm going to hope that it's gotten, uh, got, that's good English, it's, excuse me, it's gotten easier for you. So the next round I'll only do two minutes, and then we'll uh, start to analyze our data. Okay, last uh, round of scale uh, recording starts with this screen. So go ahead and do it. I'm gonna just give you two minutes this time. Again, accuracy is more important than speed. And we'll analyze these in a moment. So two minutes.
All right, about 30 seconds left. Okay, go ahead and finish up your last scale. Thank you for those of you that are chiming in here. Yeah, you're definitely starting to see patterns and <laughs> so am I. Good. Somebody noticed that the green stickers tend to have the similar information on them. Good observation. Don't forget it's a different fish. And even though it says June San Juan, there's 30 days in June. So I didn't put the individual date on there because you can imagine how incredible your data sheet would be if you had the different days in the month as well. Okay, so you've got your data sheet in front of you. Uh, hopefully you can see mine. I'll show you what mine ended up looking like. Hopefully you can see that. And let's go ahead and analyze our data. So go ahead and go to your month area. Count how many marks you had in the busiest month. So for example, right here, I have June being the busiest, and right now I've got five, 10, 15, 20. I've got about 32 marks in June, okay? So whatever month you have that's the highest, count up your uh, individual marks, circle it. Then go to uh, your pods. Which pod has the most marks? Go ahead and circle it. Then go to your area. Which area seems to be the most important? Circle that circle the most important type of fish, and then go ahead and circle the most important rivers. Hopefully that's fairly quick. Okay, Joe, let's go back to the questions and let's see if most people were correct. So if you're still circling, go ahead and circle, that's fine, but just listen in. So I wanna make sure we have time for question and answers. So what are the Southern resident killer whales eating? Well, as I told you earlier, it's fish, obviously, right? Most of the fish is going to be salmon, and most of it's going to be Chinook, particularly in the summer. Those Chinook, historically in this area, were quite large. Imagine a fish that's somewhere between 40, 50, 60, 80 pounds, four feet long, enormous fish. Uh, they could get away with eating maybe one or two of those a day. They're still looking for those Chinook fish, even though in this area, they're not as abundant as they once were. The second most important fish is probably going to be chum. Uh, that's mostly what they switch over to during the winter. Uh, they will eat coho. Uh, you'll get some steelhead mixed in there as well. And someone mentioned cod earlier. You were correct. They will pinch a few of those off as well. Next question is, when are they eating it? If you look at your data, it seems to be they're mostly eating in the summer. Hi, they're just like a humpback. That's not correct. They're eating year round. And the reason that there's a gap in the data is because it's much more difficult for we as researchers to get out on the water during the winter around here due to the weather and ocean conditions. I'm gonna show you some information from the National Marine Sanctuary in a second. That's starting to change a little bit. But these animals are indeed eating around the year. Where are they eating? I gave you four areas, San Juans, Georgia Strait, Puget Sound, and Rosario. As some of you have pointed out, the San Juan Islands, which are a national monument in and of themselves, tends to be the area where we see them eating the most, particularly in the summer, where they're the easiest to study. We haven't done a lot of research off the coast in the deeper ocean. We're starting to, I'll show you some of that data in a little bit, but these animals, particularly in the summer, are eating in Washington state waters, in the San Juans, out the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and actually in the National Marine Sanctuary. I also asked you who's eating it. Which pod do we see the most? We tend to see J-pod. Historically, that was the group of whales that we saw in the Puget Sound, Salish Sea, National Marine Sanctuary area every month of the year. Uh, K's tend to disappear a little bit in the winter, so do L's, but sadly things are shifting. Uh, we used to see J's every month of the year in this area. 
we've now gone uh, great lengths of time, four to six weeks at a time without seeing these whales, particularly J-pod. So their pattern around here is changing as the food and prey distribution change as well. And finally, I said, where's the food coming from? Most of you noticed that it's either from the lower Thompson River or the middle Fraser River, or in some cases, the unknown river. There's a couple problems here. The Fraser and the Thompson, both of those river systems, those uh, watersheds are in British Columbia, Canada. So the southern resident killer whales share a, a transboundary area between Canada and the US. And in the summer, they're highly dependent upon Canadian salmon, okay? During the winter, it starts to shift. We start to see them uh, uh, predating on Columbia River fish more frequently. But the problem is, is there's a lot of unknown rivers out there. Now that doesn't mean we don't know the river, it just means we don't know the salmon that are inhabiting those rivers and how best to protect them. So if you wanna be a killer whale researcher and you really wanna help whales, I'd suggest you be a salmon researcher too because we really need to get our mind wrapped around all the different types of salmon, where they're at, map these areas so that we can help protect them. So hopefully some of your predictions and hypotheses in this game were correct. I will guess that some of them weren't, and that's okay based on what you told me earlier. Remember, science is always evolving, it's always learning, and stuff is changing. And speaking of changing, as I said, most of the data that we have came from the San Juan area, which is right here. So here's Washington State, this is British Columbia, Canada, Vancouver Island. If you look on the map, here's the Thompson River system, goes all the way up, here's the North Thompson, and look at this, here's the Fraser River. So you can imagine a fish being born in the mountains, swimming all the way down these rivers, all the way out into the Pacific Ocean, all the way up to Alaska for the most part, and then they come back to, of course, spawn and lay their eggs. Most of your samples all came from Canada, but check it out. Here's where the National Marine Sanctuary is, the Olympic one we've been talking about. We are starting to work out there in the winter and check out what we're finding out. This is brand new data. So during the winter, you will notice that we have been collecting prey samples out there since 2009 to 2015. And out there, we've collected all sorts of Chinook fish. A lot of them are coming from the Puget Sound, the Columbia, the Snake River, and they're all hanging out in the winter out here off the Olympic National Marine Sanctuary. So not only is the summer area important to them, the marine sanctuary is important to them. And what I think is happening as the fish become less abundant in the inner Sailor Sea Puget Sound area, you're actually going to find the southern resident killer whales out here in the Olympic, marine area, Olympic National Marine Sanctuary area because this is where the fish are hanging out these days, not so much inshore in the San Juans like they used to. Okay, so thanks for joining us for this part of the game. Of course, the show's not done yet. If you're interested in more information about killer whales, check out our webpage. You can go to the resource page. There's more games for you to play there. Also, if you wanna make your home orca safe, no matter where you're at in the country, you can help animals by doing this activity. And since you guys have been such a great scientific audience today, if you go to the Killer Whale Tales website, you can even download Orca trading cards. These are like baseball cards, except they have whales on them. And these are the whales, like I said, that you most frequently see off the west coast of the United States, and particularly, and more frequently, in the Olympic National Marine Sanctuary. Okay, Joe, I'm gonna kick it back over to you, if I can. There you go. And let's do some question and answers. And I think Hannah had a couple things that she wanted to bring up as well. Yeah, I just wanted to mention with all of this talk and discussion and research about the Southern resident killer whale that I would provide information to you that they are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, as well as the Washington state and Canadian laws. So they are a very protected species. Um, we recommend that you do not feed them or try to feed any marine mammals and that they are not for swimming with, riding, petting, touching, or try not to have interactions with marine mammals. They're amazing to look at when you do have encounters with them, but try not to interact with marine mammals. Um, and then follow lo local rules about keeping a safe distance from them as well. 
Now that you are researchers of the southern resident killer whale, it's important to know this stuff. So there's more information at fisheries.noaa.gov and bewhalewise.org. That's all that I have to share, but I'm happy to turn it over to Q&A. All right, excellent. Well, uh, for those who'd like to send in some questions, the Slido room is open. You can put your questions there. I'll also be looking at the question bar right in the GoToWebinar, so we can take questions from both spots. And the first one we have, Jeff, Marcia wants to know, uh, you told us that the population is, has fallen to around 72. What would be a healthy population for that, um, for the southern species? Well, that's a really great question. And so there's been a lot of time and effort spent into trying to figure out how many uh, southern resident killer whales were in this area uh, historically. So the best guess puts it somewhere between two and 300. We have another group of killer whales called the northern resident killer whales. Uh, they're distantly related to our southern resident killer whales, although they no longer hang out with them or eat with them or make babies with them. Um, they're about 300 plus right now. We figured their population is fairly stable, fairly healthy. They are a species of concern. We're keeping an eye on them. But 72 to 73 animals is probably about a third of what was here historically. And probably we're pushing the limits of a healthy population at this point. I don't think they can go much lower. I think I'd like to see them at least at 120 to maybe 150 to make sure there's enough genetic diversity to keep this group going. All right. So Marie is wondering about how often you're out uh, collecting scales during the year. Um, each year, NOAA Fisheries sends out um, a research team, usually in May for three weeks and then again in September. Uh, so you're looking at about six weeks during the summer that we're collecting actively. Um, then during the winter, uh, we're opportunistically on the water, depending uh, mostly upon weather conditions. Uh, and those are like, you know, individual days here and there, November through February. Um, but in general, we try to be on the water at least six weeks of the year and weather permitting more. Okay. So Blake and Brooke are tuning in and they're curious about the typical lifespan of a killer whale. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the typical lifespan of wild southern resident killer whales are females are gonna live into their 40s or 50s. We have seen females live as long as 80 to 85 years old. Uh, males in general tend to live into their 20s. Uh, we've had a male go perhaps as long as 60, but for the most part, the males are living to about 20. So females live about twice, sometimes three times as long as the males. Um, and it's really rare that you would see a female live 80 years, although we have had that. And like I said, we've had one male that we're pretty sure was uh, almost 60 when he died a few years ago. All right. Uh, let's see. So uh, another question from the Slido room here. Curious. In your opinion, what do you think are a couple of the biggest contributors to the population, uh, you know, falling? Sure. Um, so I think science is pointing to three really key ones. One is going to, of course, be lack of food and the lack of salmon in this area. Uh, drastic changes in salmon in this area is going to be one of the biggest reasons they're having trouble. Second reason is going to be pollution. Um, pollution in this area has changed. Uh, obviously, in some ways, it's getting better. In some ways, it's getting worse. Uh, and the pollution actually gets into the whales, and it binds itself to their fat cells. Uh, these things are toxic. They mimic the hormones in these animals. And as you know, hormones are regulating uh, functions throughout the animal's body. Uh, so the ingesting of uh, pollution is a huge problem. Uh, and last but not least is going to be the effects of noise, whether that's uh, a boat, uh, large tanker ships, private fishing boats, uh, commercial fishing vessels, military. These animals use sound to see. So if it's a noisy environment, it's harder for them to communicate with each other to hunt, and it's also harder for them to echolocate and find food. Um, we also, during the 60s, captured a lot of uh, younger animals out of this population to put in aquariums around the world. That was a kick in the pants for them, too. Uh, and last, and this is just an emerging um, issue, is of course going to be climate change. Uh, climate change, particularly in the Northwest here, is going to change salmon runs and salmon habitat uh, immensely. 
So we've got to get our mind wrapped around how can we stop the warming of the planet if it is indeed human uh, related, what can we do to help? And that's why I ask kids, no matter where you are uh, in the country, to if you can help mitigate that, you're helping not only the animals in your environment, but you're going to help the southern residents as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's grab another one here. Why is it that a specific population of whale would specialize on a, a particular prey when there may be other sources around too? That's a really great question. And I think the best answer is, I don't know. Um, I think historically, uh, these animals after the last ice age uh, moved in and over time they developed uh, a speciality as far as uh, type of prey they were after, the skills required to hunt that prey, um, and they filled a niche where they weren't competing with another animal. So in the Puget Sound, Salish Sea area, we have three types of killer whales here. Uh, one group's called offshores, which are frequently offshore eating sharks. You have our resident eating, uh, a resident salmon eating uh, killer whales, the southern residents, and you have what we call transients or big killer whales. They're eating marine mammals. So you actually have three apex predators, three different types of killer whales sharing the same habitat range, but not competing. So essentially working together cooperatively to make sure that each community is getting what they need to eat and survive, but doing so in a way that they're not competing. Why did they do that? That's a really good question. And I guess you ask, well, wait a minute, if there really is more uh, one food source, why aren't they switching? That's a great question. Uh, in some cases, the residents can't switch because anatomically, they're not built to kill and eat other types of prey like seals or dolphins or porpoises, so they can't. But why aren't they switching? That's a really good question. And how they ended up here, it just seems that they work together to fill a niche without competing with each other. All right, so we have time to squeeze in one more question here. Well, one that I should slip into is those those resources, Jeff. Yeah. Um, a uh, few educators are really asking about, uh, could they see the link again or where they could find them? Um, uh, yeah. Are you able to maybe drop it in the Slido room? That would uh, be a good if I, if I just drop it and type your question, will it show up there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah, they can okay. visit our website at killerwhaletales.org. Um, if they're on the West Coast, and of course the pandemic changes its course, uh, we do visit schools all throughout the region at no cost to the school. We'd be glad to come and do, our, normally our program's three hours long, so we'd be glad to come and do the three-hour program there. We are also doing online classes uh, on um, throughout the school year. It sounds very similar to Joe, what you're doing. So go ahead and check out killthewhaletells.org, go to the registration page, and if you have any questions that aren't answered there, you can uh, contact me via the email, and there's a link there as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, Jeff, a uh, huge thank you for taking us out into your world and showing us a little bit of science. Uh, you know, I think good scientists always say that you go out with 10 questions and come up with, come back with 100. And I think exactly. that's just, that's how science works is, is you go out, you try to figure out pieces. Uh, and sometimes it's a long process that brings more questions. So uh, yep. Jacqueline, I also want to give you a huge thank you. Thank you for joining us today and sharing uh, some of the wonders of the National Marine Sanctuary. And Hannah's going to take over for a minute now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Jeff and Jacqueline. I think that that was one of our most engaging and definitely most fun Exploring by the Severe Pants partner live interaction so far. So I hope all of the attendees have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, I would like to say that we do record all of our live interactions and they are hosted on Exploring by the Severe Pants YouTube channel. If you want to give us about a week to get this one up, We'll have it posted shortly, but there are about 13 live interactions in a playlist called National Marine Sanctuaries that you can watch um, from our previous programs. Upcoming next week, we have Jill Heinert. She's a cave diver discussing what it's like to cave dive in Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So that will be our next live interaction with Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants. I encourage you to register on our website, just like you registered for this one. And if you're interested in live interactions about the ocean in general, I'd like to point you to a few other resources. We have the ones like this, tailored for students, the National Marine Sanctuary's live interactions. 
We have a webinar series tailored for educators, the National Marine Sanctuary web webinar series. And then I'd also love to highlight Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. They bring in explorers, scientists from all different backgrounds right to you and right to your home in engaging ways just like this program. So I definitely encourage you to go check out more of Joe's programs. And then NOAA Ocean Today offers a full moon webinar series where they talk about ocean issues. And following today's webinar, as soon as I conclude this slide, you will be prompted to take a short survey. So if you happen to be an adult or if your parent is around, if you would like to fill out the distance learning survey to let us know how you use this tool what you'd like to see with live interactions in the future, it would be extremely helpful and helps us create programs directly for you. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending today and becoming killer whale scientists. Super exciting. I'd like to thank Joe, Jacqueline, and Jeff all for partaking in today's live interaction. And I hope you all have a great weekend and rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.